Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Humanities Forum. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the philosophy department here and the humanities program and the director of the forum. Someone in the back can't hear me quite well enough. Let me know, Patrick, if it's good. Thank you. The Humanities Forum exists to provide regular opportunities throughout the semester for the entire campus community to consider some of the deepest human things. Today's forum is a very special occasion. It's our inaugural St. Albert the Great Lecture in Science and Humanities, offered in honor of Louis Verza. Before we introduce our distinguished guests, let me say a few words about the nature of this lecture. St. Albert the Great was a German Dominican friar and arguably the greatest German philosopher and theologian of the Middle Ages. He helped introduce the study of Aristotle into the medieval universities, was the most important teacher of St. Thomas Aquinas, and is one of only 37 named doctors of the church. He was also well known for his scientific studies, and in 1941, Pope Pius XII declared him the patron saint of the natural sciences. It's therefore fitting that he is likewise the patron of this annual lecture that brings the sciences into conversation with the humanities, a task, I think, that is particularly urgent in our world today. This lecture is also made possible by a generous gift in honor of Louis Verza. Louis Verza was born in Vincenza in northern Italy and emigrated to the United States in 1905 where he eventually founded a successful tanning company employing close to 300 people. He had a lifelong affection for the outdoors and the natural world. He's pictured uh, behind me with his English setter, White Buck. And while he himself was not a student at PC, he was instrumental in helping members of his family attend. It's therefore with sincere gratitude and appreciation that we offer this lecture in his honor. And now to introduce this afternoon's special guest, I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Jim Keating, a member of the Theology Department and the Director of the Humanities Program. I think we're gonna have to lower this, perhaps. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kristen Collier to Providence College and vice versa. Dr. Collier is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Michigan. She is also the Director of the Program on Health, Spirituality, and Religion at the Medical School there. They must like her a great deal since they knew exactly what they were getting. She received her medical degree and before that her bachelor's from the University of Michigan and completed her internship, residency, and chief residency in their hospitals. Perhaps prophets are not honored in their hometown, but apparently good doctors are. She has published widely and well in her chosen field on the, uh, of the intersection of religion and medicine, and is, I am told, the proud mother of four bouncy boys. We have brought Dr. Collier here to help us think about a question of some urgency. As most of you know, Providence College has just created a new school of nursing and health science. The new thing is nursing, of course. And Father Sicard has made it clear that the, that, we, that, that the way we shall educate and form our nursing students will itself be informed by Providence College's distinctive Catholic and Dominican identity. This is far easier said than done, of course. The medical field is fraught with questions of limited resources and their distribution, the invaluable dignity of persons regardless of their states of dependence, and of course, how we are to treat our fellow human beings at the very beginning and end of their lives. How we think about these questions is determined by what we think is true of the human being. Medical science focuses on the mechanics of the human body, but these bodies, all of which will eventually wear out, are only part of the story and not the most important part. Nurses encounter this truth in a profound way since they are often called upon to care for those whose bodies will not be getting well. It is crucial then that in addition to learning how the body works, nursing students must learn how the human being as a union of body and soul work. 
That's where the humanities come in, Providence College's specialty. Catholics, after all, are convinced that God's very self became a specific human being in a specific place and at a specific time. By consequence, Catholics insist that to be truly educated is to grow familiar with how human beings have expressed themselves, their joys and sorrows, their triumphs and failures, their brightest hopes and darkest fears in literature, philosophy, art, music, and so on. The St. Albert the Great Lecture in Science and the Humanities is dedicated to addressing questions of how best to unite the study of nature and the human being. We could not have done better than to begin with Dr. Christian Collier. I probably would have said that regardless of who we had gotten, but as you shall soon see, in this case, it is perfectly true. Please welcome Christian Collier. Thank you for having me. I'm just going to set up briefly here. Good to see everybody. So I'm quite honored to be here. This is my first trip to Providence and to be the inaugural speaker for the St. Albert the Great Lecture in the Science of the Humanities. And I just want to thank so much Drs. Keating and Hain for inviting me. I'm honored to be giving a talk named after the great St. Albert, who we just heard is the patron saint of scientists, philosophers, medical technicians, and the natural sciences. My talk today, therefore, will touch on many of these subjects and hopefully give us much to think about, to discuss in our time together after my formal remarks. You know you've been asked to speak to humanities folks when you're asked to have a paper that's 50 minutes long, and I can't recall the last time I gave a paper of this length, so please bear with me. Also, for my one and only disclaimer, I'm not a philosopher, and so if I say something that isn't quite right, ask for your forgiveness in advance. So I am first and foremost in my professional life a physician. So I'm choosing to focus my remarks on the practice of medicine. And I hope that this will be of interest and relevance to all of us, as the vocation of medicine does touch all of us. For at some point in our lives, all of us have been or will be patients. So I've chosen the name of my talk today to be the meaning of medicine. What is medicine for? So let's begin. The Scientist and the Poet is an essay written by English professor Paul A. Cantor in the journal The New Atlantis, which draws upon tensions between how scientists and poets see the world. He writes, quote, poets generally seem to be unsympathetic to science. They question its capacity to tell us the full truth about our world, end quote. This is a notion worth considering for medical doctors and leaders in healthcare. Why would the poets think that objective science would be less than revealing of the full truth? The piece moves through excerpts of works through famous romantic poets, beginning with Goethe, who is both a poet and a scientist, and ends alarmingly with reflections from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Cantor's critique of science through Frankenstein is that science is good, provided it is oriented towards the humane. In Frankenstein, as you know, science is a victim of its own power over nature. In the novel, the protagonist, Vicar Frankenstein, tells of his dedication to science, his study of chemistry and natural philosophy at the university, and his commitment to scientific research. But in the course of practicing science, somehow the power of science escaped Victor's control. Cantor concludes, quote, the basic lesson that Frankenstein can teach us is this, Science can tell us how to do something, but it cannot tell us whether we should do it. And to explore that question, we must step outside the narrow range of science's purely technical questions and look at the full human context and consequences of what we're doing. What Cantor is saying here is essential. Medicine is largely unable to see beyond the scientific technical to its full human context. This is depicted in the novel Frankenstein as a pitfall of modern medicine. Science, indeed, has something to learn from the poet, the novelist, the essayist, and philosopher. Yet medicine has a very difficult time incorporating the humanities, literature, poetry, theology, history, etc. Why is this? Is there some unspoken rule that medicine can only draw upon the hard, si hard sciences? Interestingly, the prominent and respected journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, includes a very small section titled Humanities, which appears dead last, 
after all the scientific technical medical studies. A charitable view would suggest that this humanities section is last because medicine's goals are found in the humanities. Medicine, after all, is a practice focused on human beings, humanity. Medicine is a human profession in its purest form. Medical doctors are human beings who take care of other human beings. The heart of medicine is found in the humanities. Therefore, why does medicine marginalize them? Cantor would likely conclude that a true fullness of medicine is found in the union between the humanities and the sciences. And perhaps this idea touches on a possible resolution for the tension between the scientist and the poet. So my aim in this lecture is to show how the science and technology of modern medicine needs to unite itself with and be guided by the humanities, particularly philosophy, in order to understand what medicine is for. And I'll be doing so by drawing on the work of John Henry Newman, Mill, Bishop, Aristotle, Steinbeck, Kreeft, and T.S. Eliot. I will lay out the problem with medicine as I see it, then explore how we got here, some potential remedies, and end with the role of the church. Philosophy requires leaders in medicine to ask and then answer a basic question. What is medicine for? Science fails to even ask such a basic question because such a question is explored in the humanities, not through the sciences. But this question and its answer are paramount for the vocation of medicine to wrestle with if we are to wisely guide medicine through the 21st century. So what can medicine learn from the humanities? Let's go back in time for the humanities love history to London on the 28th of May in the year 1934 to London's Sadler's Wells Theater. The Rock by the great poet T.S. Eliot is making its debut. It is a time of great industrial and scientific progress in Europe, much like today. But the opening stanzas of the play arrest the listening audience with what has become lost in progress. Quote, the eagle soars in the summit of heaven. The hunter with his dogs pursues his circuit. O oh, perpetual revolution of configured stars. O oh, perpetual recurrence of determined seasons. O oh, world of spring and autumn, birth and dying. The endless cycle of ideas and actions, endless invention, endless experiment, brings knowledge of motion, but not of stillness. Knowledge of speech, but not of silence. Knowledge of words, but ignorance of the word. All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All our ignorance brings us nearer to death. But nearness to death, no nearer to God. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? The cycles of heaven in 20 centuries bring us farther from God and nearer to the dust, end quote. Science and industry are perpetually busy, participating in that cycle of idea and action, endless invention, endless experiment. But there's a tragic punchline to this progress, a paradox that arrests the modern sensibility in the closing stanzas of the poem. Where is the life that we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Today, there is a disenchantment in the calling of medicine, wrought through the sciences and technical knowledge that have crowded out wisdom. Policy expert and physician R.J. Bulgar stated in an essay in JAMA at the turn of the century, quote, the greatest challenge facing the academic healthcare community is to restore the marriage between humanistic concerns and scientific and technical excellence in healthcare delivery practices, end quote. When I first saw this quote, I was really moved by it. I'm interested in something called um, the field of narrative medicine, which looks at how language and stories in healthcare can reshape medicine. And the language in this passage intrigued me. Bulger doesn't state that this challenge is one of many challenges or a challenge, but our greatest challenge. And this word choice of restore as if the humanities and science maybe were once united in the past and they aren't now, this made me question why. And even the word marriage here invokes a clear sense of intimacy between science and humanities that may seem foreign to today's physicians. And lastly, having been a doctor for over 20 years now, I realize that very often it's the humanistic or existential concerns of my patients that bother them or worry them even more than some of the scientific ones in their case. This statement actually became my professional mission statement after I read it. 
So I've come to believe, actually, that the erosion of the medical humanities and the practice of medicine is associated with an accompanying loss of meaning in medicine, which can lead to physician burnout, the loss of personal relationship between the physician and patient due to the medical gaze of the physician, and the overall disenchantment of medicine as its practice is purely a hard science. Strictly scientific medicine lacking in the humanities makes medicine into less than what it's supposed to be. These shortcomings in medicine today can be evidenced through growing estrangement we witness between physician and patient and the breakdown in human trust between them. Loss of faith in the integrity of the vocation of medicine is at stake here in the eyes of society. Again, this is largely because of the loss of the humane within the practice of medicine when it's reduced to purely a scientific endeavor. These medical wounds, ironically, science does not have the power to heal because science is assumed to be values neutral. Science cannot tell us how medicine ought to be. Science cannot tell us if medicine is sick or not. Science is without wisdom, but the humanities are chock full of wisdom. Therefore, the practice of medicine ought to be built upon the wisdom of the humanities in order to ensure the science of medicine is humane. As many of you know, philosophy has literally translated the love of wisdom. Wisdom is not knowledge. Knowledge is science, and science is the ancient word for knowledge rooted in the word to know. Knowledge is the raw materials of information turned into science knowledge, but wisdom is something richer, more fully human than science, but it is not the absence of science. Wisdom is the final product of what information and knowledge are to achieve. Knowledge and science are in the service of wisdom, never the other way around. Philosophy, therefore, is that which takes science to its right end. No one would argue that science should not be wise, but without philosophy, how can science know what its purpose is? What was the purpose of Victor Frankenstein's science that he practiced? The scientific tragedy which unfolded in Frankenstein was that science, that is knowledge, lacked wisdom to guide it. To loop St. Albert the Great back into my talk, Albert was very interested in Aristotle, as we heard, and he made commentary on nearly all of Aristotle's works. So therefore, I thought it only proper to bring Aristotle into this paper. As many of you know, Aristotle wrote about three types of knowledge in his Nicomachean Ethics, Episteme, Tecne, and Phrenesis. Thinking about medicine, episteme, right, is the bare scientific knowledge or the facts, knowing what something is. Techne is knowing how to do something, which we all do in medicine, a lot of procedures, operations, mechanics, and today encompasses the copious use of technology. But phrenesis, however, is a very different type of knowledge from the other two, and what today we would call wisdom. Phrenesis is practical wisdom, knowing the why towards what good of something. Modern medicine is excellent at both episteme and techne but philosophical questions found in phronesis are largely absent in the practice of medicine. The phronesis of medicine cannot be explored in a technical science model, so medicine needs a philosophical lens to be able to see why medicine knows what it knows and does what it does. And without such a lens, medicine robs itself of a proper understanding of its goals, meaning, and purpose in its practice and reduces itself to a production. This is why philosophy or phronesis is indispensable to the wise practice of medicine. And thinking back to our T.S. Eliot poem, without philosophy, the physician is lost in that perpetual and frenetic operation of technological science, information, and knowledge, battling sickness and striving for health, but lacking the wisdom to even know what those words mean, nor understanding what medicine is for. To illustrate, can a doctor's command of deep scientific knowledge and exhaustive use of technology illuminate the reason for medicine's being? Obviously not. Science and technology are agnostic to these questions of meaning and purpose found innate in the philosophy of medicine. We cannot look to science and technology in order to discover the heart and soul of medicine. We must look to philosophy and the humanities to find medicine's true calling. And that calling is found not in earthly knowledge or science alone, not using that knowledge towards some production or treatment of disease, but medicine's true calling is found in praxis. That is why medicine, properly understood by philosophy, is a practice, not just knowledge used in producing some desired medical outcome. Healing patients with science is not enough if we have not answered the questions, why are we healing? Towards what goal is this medicine being practiced? I argue that all practices, as distinguished from scientific facts and procedures, must aim for a transcendental end or good. Money, for example, is not a transcendental good, but God is. Therefore, a practice is something aimed towards the transcendentals of God, 
Examples of transcendentals are more than goods, for again, how do we define goods? But I suggest that true transcendentals are focused around activities that bring humanity in communion with God. Traditionally, it is said, barring from Aristotle, that medicine is in the service of health. Health is a good, but in of itself, I would further articulate that health is not necessarily a transcendental good. Health can be sent on oneself. Health can be wasted. In addition, we don't find our end in health, but in God. Our health will fail. We will die. The transcendentals by nature are mortal. Therefore, health is a good when used in the service of a higher good, one with its final purpose in God. Therefore, we should not waste the good of health on ourselves, but should dedicate our health in thanksgiving back to the Lord towards the transcendental good of him who can provide for us even after our health has faded, even after death. Even so, with health being a good, how should we define health? Is it bodily only? Does it include emotional, spiritual, communal aspect of our lives? It includes all of these, of course. But as we saw from the novel Frankenstein, the techno-scientific lacking in the humanities and therefore focused only on the bodily aspects of man, organs, and cells, result in a nightmare anthropology of man, one we see witnessed in Frankenstein's monster, a bodily patchwork that fell short of mankind. But even if we were to define health to include all the aspects of mankind proper, physical, social, emotional, spiritual, we still have not reached towards the transcendental ends. Medicine, I argue, like Dante in his journey, must ultimately reach up into the heavens where God is. Wisdom directs medicine there, so medicine must go there. Medicine is in the service to humanity, reaching for God. That is what true medicine is for. Medicine is in the service of humanity, touching the divine. Physicians are in the service of caring for the very imago Dei. This caring for the image in itself, with this goal of restoring man towards the divine, is therefore a transcendental good and of medicine. This is medicine as a practice in the service of the transcendental goods, not medicine as knowledge or production aimed itself at temporal goods. Without this transcendental good at the heart of medicine, medicine risks becoming a production as actually Aristotle thought that it was. Production, as you know, is aimed at goals that are external to itself, such as making money or some other goal that does not find its end in God. Medicine is a practice and not a production because inherent within medicine is a deontology, a moral compass, or duty, which science and technology by nature lack, but medicine is a practice in bodies. And this moral aspect of medicine is found essential to its practice because medicine is in the service of the image of the divine. Science and technology may be able to produce many outcomes, but it is moral medicine which gives some science and technology its moral shape and duty, determining what medicine is desirable for humanity and why. Medicine, therefore, is not values neutral, but is moral in its essential practice, and therefore directs science and technology to where it should go or should not go. To see what medicine is, one must therefore look beyond the scope of science and technology to the very heart of medicine as a practice, rooted in caring for the transcendental good of mankind himself, who finds his end in God. But the powerful and profitable tools of science and technology have created a myopic lens, one that is too earthly focused, through which medicine's gaze has been captivated for at least a century and probably much longer. This earthly scientific technical gaze is powerful, but it's devoid of true philosophy. It cannot see what man is or what medicine is for. But philosophy rightly applied to medicine tells us the sick patient is a human being something that technology can never, nor will it ever, be able to see. Humanity is something only philosophy can access through the lens of a human being, using this tool as a lens to see the other human beings more fully. Just as philosophy is the only tool that can be used to fully understand the world through the sciences and the arts, so too is humanity, that is human beings, the only personhood which can operate this tool of philosophy to discover the truth. Technology can never see another human being truly because technology cannot wield the tool of philosophy. Only man can wield the tool of philosophy. Human beings are physical creatures, yes, who possess intellect and will and emotion and fear and love and pain and empathy. But most importantly, human beings possess personhood. Human beings uniquely possess personhood, which philosophy has always understood, but which modern medicine has lost. Technology does not understand the philosophical concept of who that is found in personhood. Only philosophy does. 
This is because medicine is not looking through the right lens. Medicine is not using the right tool or lens to understand our world. Medicine therefore needs a basic tool besides science and technology to discover what man and medicine are for. Medical leaders in particular need to know what that tool is and how to use it so they can re-enchant medicine, restore it, and make medicine healthy and humane again. Medicine needs to heal itself for humanity to once again become enchanted with medicine again. Again, the tool that can heal medicine is simply put, philosophy. So thinking philosophically, we can hopefully contrast that to thinking technically and see that philosophy is the better lens through which to see the world. Ultimately, I would argue philosophy is the only lens through which mankind understands the world in which he inhabits. Philosophy is a gift. We should use this gift because this gift helps us to define and understand and explain the world and people and animals and plants and all the organisms and all the things which inhabit the world. Using the tool of philosophy in the hand of physician, the physician philosopher, therefore, can attempt to explain everything and anything. The physician philosopher is not limited to only the physical world like technology and machines, for the philosopher sees all dimensions of reality, visible and invisible, through truly human eyes. The eyes of humanity through the lens of philosophy are the greatest technologies for seeing another human being. So the physician philosopher uses the sciences, but in a comprehensive way now, including metaphysics, within the dimensions of seeing reality. The physician philosopher probes into and dissects the precise nature of what a human being is. In fact, philosophy can dissect anything in the world because philosophy alone has access to all the sciences fully. This seems like a grandiose statement, but it is only saying what has already been said, which is that philosophy is the tool through which all of nature in every dimension and aspect can be accessed. Philosophical tools are a great asset to the physician to help him or her better understand what mankind is and all his components, physical and non-physical combined. In fact, philosophy can even discover what medicine really is beyond its procedures and practices, technology and bureaucracy. Philosophy can help medicine to discover its true north, if you will, and rediscover its true purpose. But unfortunately, a biomedical reductionism of the technoscience has pervaded medicine and unsurprisingly has many consequences one of them is an infecting of the language that we use within the profession. To give you an example of what this looks like, one of the phrases often used in medicine is, oh, she's a machine, to describe an unusually productive colleague. It's meant to be laudatory. This person gets respect because they get stuff done, often in a superhuman way, doesn't eat sleep, cranks it out, etc. While hard work and accomplishments are certainly respectable, I strive to remind my students and trainees that only are they not a machine, but neither should they strive to be one. By lapsing into this way of thinking, one strips away the very essence of what medicine is. Medicine is not merely a technical endeavor. Above all else, it's a human one. To illustrate this, let's turn to the work of John Steinbeck. In The Grapes of Wrath, Steinbeck writes a story about a family of low resources during the Great Depression who are driven from their home because of drought and economic hardship. It was a time of great technological industrial advancement, especially for farming. And Steinbeck reflects on the nature of man when he writes, quote, carbon is not a man, nor salt, nor water, nor calcium. He is all these, but he is much more, much more. And the land is so much more than its analysis. The man who is more than his chemistry, that man who is more than his elements, knows the land that is more than its analysis. But the machine man driving a dead tractor and land he does not know and love understands only chemistry. And he is contemptuous of the land and of himself." End quote. Let's read that last line again. The machine man understands only chemistry and he is contemptuous of the land and of himself. What if I substituted the word patient in for the word land? He becomes contemptuous of the patient and of himself. I'm sure you've heard a lot about the crisis of physician burnout. The syndrome and its causes are very complex, but the result of burnout is depersonalization. You start seeing the patient in front of you as a non-person, the one that you went into medicine for, and you can become contemptuous of the patient. The patient becomes an impediment for just getting out of here, and the physician's feelings become disordered towards themselves as well. How do we even know the true nature of man, the patient, 
and ourselves without engaging the humanities. From the first day of med school, students start learning a lot of biochemistry, a lot of histology, a lot of pharmacology, and that's great. The science is actually really beautiful, and there's so much science to know. But is this all medical education should be? A memorization of facts? How does one make sense of what one is learning without a ground on which these facts can properly germinate? How does one learn the limits of the biomedical sciences if one is only immersed within said fields? As St. John Henry Newman writes, quote, there are men who embrace in their minds a vast multitude of ideas, but with little sensibility about their real relations towards each other, end quote. So the risk of current medical education, the one that I fell into, was that you can come out of med school with a reductionist, mechanistic view of people and ultimately of yourself. One can easily end up seeing their patients as just a bag of blood or bones, or viewing life as just molecules in motion. To bring a little Wendell Berry into the afternoon, I think of the Humanities Foundation as this proper soil upon which the seeds that are planted in the biomedical sciences can properly germinate and grow, and then that lens of philosophy through which you can recognize and tear out the weeds that grow up from time to time in your garden. And I assume that most people don't come into medicine to take care of some receptor or some symptom or even an organ or a disease. These things are really important because they happen inside human beings. So I'll remind students, don't take your eye off the ball. You are not technicians taking care of complex machines, but human beings taking care of other human beings. And human beings are fallible. The vocation of medicine forces you very quickly to face all the terrible ways in which human bodies are fallible. And this profession can test the limits of your own body as well. I have to remind my students, unlike a machine, you do need sleep, food, rest, relationships, and most of all, love. John Henry Newman writes about the danger of medicine seeing its own profession only through a scientific technical lens. And he writes, men whose minds are possessed with some one object takes an exaggerated view of its importance, are feverish in this pursuit of it, and make it the measure of all things which are utterly foreign to it, and are startled and despondent when it happens to fail them." End quote. So medicine is in dire need of a proper philosophical grounding not found by false proxy in science and technology. Science and technology are used in medicine, by medicine, and for medicine, but they are not medicine. Newman writes that what one should strive for is an enlargement of mind, and that there is no enlargement unless there is a comparison of ideas, one with another, where a properly formed person possesses the knowledge not only of things, but of their mutual and true relations, knowledge not merely considered as acquirement, but as philosophy." End quote. Newman writes that this is obtained by having an exposure to the entirety of the liberal arts, including the humanities, but becoming self-contained within the scientific and technical biomedicine silo, absent the humanities, will leave one unable to become wise. So therefore, a philosophical undergirding of medicine is therefore necessary for both medicine and its leaders to flourish. I would say science is like a massive boat. It's a powerful boat, powered by cutting edge technology, which propels it forward. The boat's really impressive. It glitters in the sun. It moves expediently. It travels great distances. But in which direction and towards what destination? Science and technology cannot know. The thing you don't see which directs the boat of science and technology to its proper destination is the rudder of philosophy. The rudder is essential for determining the direction of science and technology towards the goal of medicine. Science and technology are to be subservient to medicine's innate goals for humanity, never the other way around. Medicine is a human practice fundamental to humankind, which stands above science and technology and therefore rules over them. The philosopher Peter Kreeft writes that philosophy can be found in the illustration of a sailing orders given to a fleet of ships. So the leaders first need to know the answer to three types of questions about the fleet of ships. How are the ships to cooperate? How each is to ship shape? And what is the mission? So modern medical ethics focuses on the first two questions. How are ships able to cooperate and sort of not bump into one another? Think about our focus on um, social ethics and how each is to stay ship shape. Think of the less explored ethics of virtue or individual ethics. But the most important question to be answered is the third. What is the mission of the fleet? 
In other words, why are they at sea? What is their purpose? These are questions of meaning and purpose and therefore require wisdom to answer them. To the philosopher's mind, this is the first and most important question one should ask. And to the ancients, the one they would have spent the most time on. But to the mind of modern medicine, this is the last one we dare ask. Why is that? First, the answer to those why questions lie in many of the major religions of the world and the study of theology from which modern medicine has totally divorced itself. Second, modern politically correct medicine is terrified of disagreement, so it avoids these deeper questions of meaning. But it's these types of questions, the philosophical question of meaning, the why, which must be answered. Those in medicine might initially think that answers to these big questions we've posed are self-evident, already presupposed and known in medicine's practice today. But as we've stated, the practice of medicine is overshadowed by the shiny production of science and technology. And I also suppose that these why questions are a different type than what modern physicians by training are accustomed to asking and therefore answering. This is a tragedy because medicine inherently is a philosophical practice whose meaning, value, and purpose are rooted in humanity. So now that I've laid out the problem, let's turn to how we got here and maybe what we can do about it. So let's turn back to St. Albert. During his life, St. Albert wrote 38 volumes covering topics ranging from philosophy to geography, astronomy, law, and friendship. In fact, he was known as Dr. Universalis, or the Universal Doctor, because of the extraordinary depth of his knowledge and learning. He refused to be siloed in one academic discipline and likely knew that to be siloed there was to have an impoverished education and an impoverished view of the world. But how did we get to a place where this type of exploration is now the exception rather than the rule? Modern medicine's tendency to exclude itself from interaction with these other sciences and arts which are not biochemical in nature prompts the question, how can a profession historically centered around the Hippocratic Oath and cradled by the church end up with a concept of flourishing focused solely on the measurable and the empirical? History provides the beginning of an answer, as Geoffrey Bishop writes in his book, The Anticipatory Corpse. It was during the French Revolution, in response to the anti-church political and social climate, that a fear of metaphysics developed, or metaphysics simply defined as that which is not physically realized. And with this move away from metaphysical realities, distrust and dislike for hospitals developed, as they were considered part of the church, and its metaphysical constructs. And out of this movement, the growth of the clinic emerged, and with it, a new way of viewing the patient. In this model, questions of the why, specifically concerning purpose and final causation, became totally irrelevant and out of the scope for the experimentalist physician. Claude Bernard, the 19th century physiologist, wrote in his book, The Introduction to the Sci Study of Experimental Medicine, that, quote, to solve the problems of life, physiologists therefore call to their aid the sciences, anatomy, physics, chemistry, which are all allies serving as indispensable tools for investigation, end quote. But of course, the physical sciences, although quite able to provide many solutions, cannot solve the deepest and most pressing problems of life. They are experts at the how questions, but the why questions often elude their grasp. And many of the most intractable problems of life, particularly those centered around death, a reality medical practitioners face time and time again, exceed the capacity of the biomedical sciences to solve. So looking in the wrong places for solutions to these questions, medicine sought answers from within itself. The goal was to become completely self-contained. Bernard, exemplifying this impulse, claims that, quote, a man of science should attend only to the opinion of men of science who understand him and should derive rules of conduct only from his own conscience, end quote. Bishop goes on to say in his writing that the result of this shift in metaphysics led to a paradigmatic change in medicine and med-ed. Thus, quote, medicine has become thoughtless. Medicine is primarily about pragmatic doing and efficient control, ordered to utilitarian maximization in its own practicality, end quote. So in this new model, medicine became a profession turned in on itself, freed from the influences of metaphysics and theology associated with our church. Next, with the goal of trying to understand the remedy for what we have been discussing, I'd like again to turn to Newman's foundational metaphor for the liberal arts. For Newman, the goal of a university learning is not the sum accretion of discrete facts in unconnected fields, but instead the formation of what he calls the circle of knowledge. In theory, the circle might be likened to a pie, where each of the liberal arts is represented as a slice of the circle. 
one slice of the pie is math, another literature, and so on, and you take bites across the breadth of subjects to learn, just by way of example. As Newman himself puts it, quote, it is a great point then to enlarge the range of studies which a university professes, even for the sake of the students, and though they cannot pursue every subject which is open to them, they will be the gainers of living among those and under those who represent the whole circle, end quote. Perfection would be a kind of perichoresis of the slices within the whole. This is the ideal liberal arts education, which aims to educate the whole person and provides what Newman calls a habit of mind, which is philosophical. But the practice of the contemporary university does not comport with Newman's ideal at all. The modern university has been remade and compartmentalized into grossly disproportionate slices. Students aren't even often afforded the opportunity to sample from more than one or a couple of random selections during their education. Newman warned that we must guard against the domination of certain sciences over and against others if we are to protect the integrity of the university. Quote, I observe then that if you drop any science out of the circle of knowledge, you cannot keep its place vacant for it. That science is completely forgotten. The other sciences close up, or in other words, they exceed their proper bounds and intrude where they have no right, end quote. We've seen clear examples of this phenomenon during the pandemic, where medicine thought it could answer all the questions that arose during the pandemic with its own lens, even into the spaces of law and theology and ethics and policy. So medicine needs to ask big questions and lean on the humanities to do so. What are these big questions that we're wrestling with right now? What does it mean to be human? Why do human beings matter? Whom do we include in our moral sphere of concern is directly aiming at the death of a patient, healthcare. What is health? What is medicine and what is it for? In this limpus terms, our goal as Christians must be to form students who see each future patient as bearing the image of God. They are more than just mere bags of bone, blown, bone and blood, more than a problem to be solved. Our ministry is not one of fixing fragmented bodies, but of healing whole persons, body and soul. And in the medical setting, our goal must be to equip our students to resist the manifold temptations to regard only part of our human reality. But when they are not exposed to the circle of knowledge, I argue, the fragmentation that's begun in your education bleeds out in the fragmentation they become to see of persons. A truncated circle of knowledge leaves us with an impoverished view of human persons and of ourselves. As Newman writes, quote, knowledge, viewed as knowledge, exerts a subtle influence and throwing us back on ourselves and making us our own center and our minds the measure of all things, end quote. So without a proper relational grounding in your education, we risk out churning technicians who see their patients as at best molecules in motion and at worst mere machines. And while Newman admits that the medical sciences alone can prove something true about our animal nature, it is not enough to justify the moral obligations imposed by medicine, precisely as it does not speak to the entirety of the human person Indeed, this malformed anthropology poses the greatest threat, in my opinion, to a proper medical and nursing education. But we are often afraid of asking big questions for reasons we discussed when we reviewed Kreef's fleet of ships analogy. But in not asking big questions, especially in medicine, we become all the worse off. And people who do, especially when they tread in unorthodox or contested spaces, often get slammed, as of what is what happened to me recently with the events at the medical school around the white coat ceremony. But I'm reminded of what John Stuart Mill wrote in 1863 about heretics. It is not the minds of heretics that are deteriorated most by the ban placed on all inquiry, which does not end in the orthodox conclusions. The greatest harm done is to those who are not heretics and whose whole mental development is cramped and their reason cowed by the fear of heresy. Who can compute what the world loses in the multitude of promising intellects combined with timid characters who dare not follow out any bold, vigorous, independent train of thought, lest it should land them in something which would admit of being considered irreligious or immoral. Among them, we may occasionally see some man of deep conscientiousness and subtle and refined understanding who spends a life in sophisticating with an intellect which he cannot silence and exhaust the resources of ingenuity in attempting to reconcile the prompting of his conscience and reason with orthodoxy, which yet he does not perhaps to the end succeed in doing. No one can be a great thinker 
who does not recognize that as a thinker it is his first duty to follow his intellect to whatever conclusions it may lead. Truth gains even more by the errors of one who with due study and preparation thinks for himself than by the true opinions of those who only hold them because they do not suffer themselves to think. He goes on to say, not that it is solely or chiefly to form great thinkers that freedom of thinking is required. On the contrary, it is much, much and even more indispensable to enable average human beings to attend the mental stature which they are capable of. There have been, and may again be, great individual thinkers in a general atmosphere of mental slavery. But there never has been, nor ever will be, in that atmosphere an intellectually active people where any people has made a temporary approach to such a character, it has been because of the dread of heterodox speculation was for a time suspended. Where there is tacit convention that principles are not to be disputed, where the discussion of the greatest questions which can occupy humanity is considered to be closed, we cannot hope to find that generally high scale of mental activity which has made some periods of history so remarkable. Never when controversy avoided the subjects which are large and important enough to kindle enthusiasm was the mind of a people stirred up from its foundations and the impulse given which raised even persons of the most ordinary intellect as something of the dignity of thinking beings, end quote. So remember, it is not the minds of heretics that are deteriorated most. By the ban placed on all inquiry which does not end in orthodox conclusions, the greatest harm is to those who are not heretics and whose whole mental development is cramped and their reason cowed by the fear of heresy. Now I'd like to revisit Newman's musings that men whose minds are possessed with some one object take exaggerated views of its importance, as feverish in the pursuit of it, make it the measure of all things which are utterly foreign to it and become startled and despondent when it fails them. I would like to share the moment when I became despondent when medicine failed me. And it failed me because I had an exaggerated view of its importance. I didn't understand the true nature of medicine and had made it the measure of all things. When I was a third year resident, my chief resident, Jake, became very ill, and he had become the one in the sick bed. He had been interviewing for a competitive fellowship position in academic cardiology. He had been losing weight, looking tired, but we all know he had been busy. He kept telling us that he had been busy. One night shortly after arriving home from a flight, he presented to our emergency department with shortness of breath and was found to have a massively enlarged liver due to the presence of multiple terrible masses. We were hoping that this was something easy, or at least easier than what he ended up having, which I won't even name here because my anger at his particular disease has decided that its name doesn't deserve a place in this talk about my friend. But what he had was bad, and it ended up taking his life. It was over the course of that year that our institution watched our friend die, but we also saw him live and it was really painful. What was even more shocking to us, all of us at some level, was that we couldn't even save one of our own people. Here we were in one of the largest academic hospitals in the entire world with all the technology and treatments at our disposal. The chair of medicine at the time actually was an oncologist. His supervisor actually was a worldwide expert in the very rare disease that Jake had, yet Jake got sicker we couldn't cure him, and he died on our watch. We lost our friend, and the world lost a great son, husband, brother, and doctor. Those of us who survived lost additional things. Collectively, we lost the deeply held belief that medicine could be our savior. What had happened, in part, is that many of us had made medicine into an idol. We had placed unrealistic hope onto something that medicine didn't deserve and couldn't live up to. When our idols come crashing down, pain ensues, but the right order of things shines out of that darkness. And I've since grown to understand the limits of medicine that are important for me to realize as I grow into the physician I need to be. I wish I could have come to know these painful truths in a different way, an easier way. But I still talk about Jake and what he taught me about medicine and the limits of the vocation to which I have chosen to dedicate my life. So I want us to move towards conclusion with taking an examination of the nature of patients as persons and the health of such persons. I give a lot of talks on bioethics to medical folks, and I love asking the question, what is health? It seems like such a simple question, right? If I were to ask you what is health, I wonder what you would say. People assume everyone has the same general idea of actually what health is. 
but often folks actually haven't deeply pondered this question. The best answer I ever received on this question actually was from a medical student at my place in the University of Michigan. And she had told me the following, and she had been an anthropology major in Iowa as an undergraduate student. And her research was in qualitative research, actually interviewing farmers, asking them like what they thought health was. And she said time and time again, the farmers kept saying things like, I don't consider myself healthy until the soil on my farm is healthy, the animals are healthy, the crops are healthy, my neighbors are healthy. It was such a beautiful antidote to the impoverished answer I often get, which is health is the absence of disease. This student's answer about the farmers speaks to a vision of health that extends beyond the individual and to a communal flourishing that involves the entire created order and really a picture of shalom. Traditional medical education does not teach health as shalom, but health as techne. Newman, in fact, reminds us that men has a moral and a religious nature, as well as a physical. He has a mind and a soul, and the mind and soul have legitimate sovereignty over the body, and the sciences relating to them have in consequence the precedence of those sciences which relate to the body. He goes on to say, after all, bodily health is not the only end of man. But why in medicine do we act like that's the case? One beautiful thing about Aristotle's philosophical system of thinking about nature, which includes both metaphysics, beyond physical, and physics, physical, as one whole construct of reality, is that it lends physicians a view of medicine that is both physical and non-physical together. By reasoning of metaphysics and physics together, medicine would include within its practice the metaphysicals, metaphysics of spirituality, with and through the physical. Cicely Saunders, who's widely considered to be the mother of modern day palliative medicine, for example, divides the patient into four quadrants, physical, emotional, social, and spiritual. These four quadrants reveal that the patient is more than just the physical. But these quadrants are not separate, but abiding within and among one another as a whole. They are interconnected between and united among one another, constituting the whole person. Thus, the spiritual affects the social, which affects the emotional, which affects the physical. So for the physician to look at and treat only the physical, is for the physician to pretend that the spiritual and social and emotional dimensions of the person, which manifest themselves in and through the physical, are not at all relevant to the care of the patient. For example, the loss of a loved one is a spiritual, emotional, and social loss, as well as physical. But the metaphysical dimensions of the patient's loss and grieving may be marginalized. It is not until the physician is made aware, usually by the patient, that the spiritual, emotional, and social loss of the loved one is that which is exacting a physical toll on the patient's health. And without the physical dimensions, perhaps the physician would not even be aware of the suffering of the patient at all. The physician must often now determine how to treat or heal the patient who is suffering grief, not only spiritually, emotionally, and socially, but also physically. It's the physical dimension which captivates the physician's attention. But what Aristotle would say is that it's the non-physical or the metaphysical, which is behind and manifested in the physical, which is causing the suffering or illness or even the disease of the patient who is grieving the loss of a loved one. And though Aristotle's particular system of perceiving the world through both the physical and the metaphysical in all its dimensions is somewhat dated and passe, even incompatible with the world as we have discovered it today through modern natural scientific disciplines, Having advanced our understanding of nature through the sciences well beyond Aristotle, nonetheless, the practice of seeing the world through both the physical and metaphysical is not something that is expired from the human gaze. In the practice of medicine, we cannot exclude metaphysics altogether. There is no denying that the physical world is not all that exists. So what can we learn from Aristotle's philosophical framework of learning, beginning with philosophy as the key, the tool, which opens up all the doors to the whole natural world, seen and unseen, we can learn that in order to understand the natural world through the sciences, we must always see nature through the lens of philosophy, which tells us what nature really is in all its dimensions, material and immaterial qualities as one. Philosophy tells us that man is something far greater than these naturalistic physical components, which we see looking through our technological instruments in medicine, using our physical senses alone. The non-physical world has a dimension in medicine that may be ignored by the practice today, but that has not always been the case. In fact, still today, the patient and many doctors subscribe to a compound metaphysical and physical worldview, or as Aristotle would state at first principles, where the spiritual and physical operate together in what we describe as nature. 
these doctors who embrace the fullness of the reality of humanity, which includes not only the physical world, but the immaterial as well, have what we might call a traditional or classical view of medicine, one closer to Aristotle's view, which is not merely atomistic or physical, but includes the metaphysical as well. The patient and the physician are persons, not just matter. Person is a metaphysical construct, combining both physical and non-physical dimensions into one. The person is a mother, daughter, sister, and patient all together in her one physical body. And the physician is all these metaphysical realities as well in one physical body too. And together, these two persons, the patient and the physician, are joined together in a mutual bond, dare I say covenant, of trust and compassion towards the goal of health in the person, physical and metaphysical, taking into account the completeness of that person, not just the physical, but the immaterial aspects of the person, emotional, intellectual, social, spiritual, cultural, familial, sexual, psychological, and existential. Human beings are physical beings, yes but they are also metaphysical beings at the same time. Some would say that those physicians who practice medicine with such a view of mankind, being both physical and non-physical together are holistic doctors. Holistic doctors are what we would likely call healers. They are constant concerned not only with fixing the physical, as technicians might do, but are also concerned with healing the whole patient in his or her complex interdependencies between the physical and non-physical domains of the person. Jeffrey Bishop writes, the fear of metaphysics and the complete abandonment of transcendental goods in medicine is operationally reflected in the way that the medical student's first patient is their cadaver in their gross lab. And he says that all of modern medicine has become mapped on the dead body and that the dead body is normative within modern medicine, hence the title of his book, The Anticipatory Corpse. It's imperative, therefore, that physician leaders in medicine need to be aware of their own metaphysical dimensions, of their own personhood, their true humanity, in order to heal medicine as a whole. As Abraham Heschel, the Jewish philosopher and theologian, once told the American Medical Society, to heal a person, one must first be a person. So given the importance of philosophy in guiding the mission and goal of the practice of medicine, let us conclude by turning back, way back to the heart of philosophy at its roots. The ancient Greek and Roman philosophers, though lacking in scientific and technical tools compared to today, were most thoughtful about the world. Here we are invoking Aristotle again. He didn't have all the sophisticated technological tools that we have today to understand the scientific world, but what he did have, which medicine has forgotten, are philosophical tools of inquiry. So picking up the boat analogy again, Aristotle's boat, science and technology, would have been very small and quite primitive compared to our modern shiny vessel. But what his boat would have had, which our modern vessel lacks, is the proper and working rudder philosophy to guide science and technology towards its proper destination, the ontology of medicine. As you all know, ontology means what something really is in itself. And as I have argued, the practice of medicine contains within itself goals, meaning, and purpose rooted in humanity, which the production of science and technology do not. The ancients therefore knew the rudder was essential to the boat's very existence for it to determine the very purpose of the boat in the first place. And I want to leave you with this thought as well, that philosophy, therefore, too, is not some separate science or art which the physician leader must learn, as we might falsely think about philosophy today, but the very eyes through which medicine wisely sees humanity. Philosophy, rightly understood, is wisdom possessed by the physician through which he or she sees humanity. And finally, I'd like to briefly examine the role of the church and the problem I've laid out. So Newman wrote, the world is a rough antagonist of spiritual truth, sometimes with a mailed hand, sometimes with pertinacious logic, sometimes with a storm of irresistible facts. It presses on against you. What it says is true, perhaps as far as it goes, but it is not the whole truth. Think about the poet and the scientist, or the most important truth. These more important truths with the natural heart admits in their substance, though it cannot maintain the being of God, the certainty of future retribution, the claims of the moral law, the reality of sin, the hope of supernatural help. Of these, the church is, in matter of fact, the undaunted and the only defender." End quote. To better understand the church is the only defender against the antagonists that abound, I'd like to return to Newman's The Idea of University to Finish, where he makes this bold claim. Quote, that great institution then, the Catholic Church, has been set up by divine mercy 
as a present visible antagonist and the only possible antagonist to sight and sense. Conscience, reason, good feeling, the instincts of our moral nature, the traditions of faith, the conclusions and deductions of philosophical religion are no match at all for the stubborn facts which are the foundation of physical and in particular of medical science, end quote. So the stubborn facts require a why behind their how. The institutional church, to Newman's mind, provides the only reconciliation between medicine's current state and its deeper roots by giving birth to a higher anthropology, one that exceeds that of human persons as the mere summation of their biomedical education. In conclusion, medicine needs to come back to the humanities because they can help illuminate these truths most clearly. The mother of narrative medicine, Rita Sharon, once wrote the following, that the training in the humanities lets one see the suffering. She says that's what the humanities are for. She writes, what one gains by the sight of suffering is the knowledge of the cost of this life. For those who are prepared, you receive a clear-eyed discernment of this thing, this life, its worth. As I end, I'm reminded that the great philosopher Alistair McIntyre, who once said that before you ask yourself, what am I to do, you must answer the question of what story am I a part? And thought I'd use this prompt to read this passage from St. Albert as I conclude my formal remarks to remind us of the beautiful way we've been grafted into the redemptive historical narratives of the scripture given to us by God. Quote, I shall not conceal a science that was before me revealed by the grace of God. I shall not keep it to myself. For being afraid of attracting its curse, what worth is a concealed science? What worth is a hidden treasure? The science I have learned without fiction, I transmit with no regret. Envy upsets everything, as envious man cannot be fair before God. Every science and knowledge proceeds from God. Saying it proceeds from the Holy Ghost is a simple way of expressing oneself. No one can thus say our Lord Jesus Christ without implying Son of God, our Father, by work and grace of the Holy Ghost. In the same manner, the science cannot be separated from the one who has communicated it unto me. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for discussion, and it's our tradition to offer the first question uh, to a student if possible. And it could be about any question about medicine, it doesn't have to be related to the talk, or anything you're, you're wondering about, about me, the vocation of medicine, the practice of medicine, the study of medicine, what is you're worried about. Mm -hmm. if, if you could, just wait a second, and I'll bring you the mic. Hi. Um, so how do you see this incorporation of metaphysics and this idea that, like, a person is more than just, like, more than just the physical? How do you see that like in a daily, like dealing with patients, mm -hmm. meeting with them, like how you incorporate mm -hmm. that into a more like daily practice? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So I'm a newer Christian. I was only baptized six years ago. And like, it's very interesting to me to have gone through my entire medical school as like an anti-theist and now to be a um, believer in um, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, to have this like different infusion of like the work that I do. I mean, I think always I thought that human beings mattered in some way. I wasn't really sure why. But now, you know, so I'm an internist, and I take care of adults with chronic medical conditions, and I see patients over time in primary care. And now, I mean, I see my patients as being made in the image of God. I mean, that is sacred space. You are take, literally taking care of people fashioned and made by God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's womb by God himself, and they bear the image of God. I mean, that, that practice by its very nature and definition is sacred. So that's the first thing. And the second thing I think about, I, I give a talk called The Theology of Medicine about how my faith is informed and should inform us as Christians. Like, what does it mean to conform your practice to Jesus Christ? But the second thing is thinking about, um, I see so many 
broken bodies. I mean, I'm an internist, so I'm not a surgeon. Like, I don't like fix things in the way that people would think of as very satisfying. I manage chronic disease, and I see people all the way till they die. And um, I think about the importance, and I, I do a lot of like obviously physical exam as part of my practice and such. And I think of the importance of bodies, and thinking about that matter matters because of the incarnation, but that that matters like value is intensified by the incarnation. I mean, it very much impacts the way I even see the importance I place on, on people's bodies. Um, and also, too, just thinking about my work that I do um, before the pandemic, I was, worked in, I was doing work at our women's prison around uh, prisoner palliative health aid training, which is training women in prison, take care of other women in prison when, they, when they're at their end of life. And thinking about like, how to defend that work, because people are like, you're one of our best internists. Like, why are you wasting your time in the prison? You know? But thinking about your theology and medicine, like Jesus Christ is the great physician. He attended to people on the margins of society, and he took care of people who everyone else had thrown away. You know. And so thinking about the people that you see, especially having a preferential option for the poor or marginalized, you're taking care of the very face of Christ himself, you're taking care of Christ himself. So again, thinking about the meaning that is infused within your work as a healthcare provider, having your Christian faith, being able to bring that to bear, it's actually really beautiful. And again, some, for a lot of people, that's just a private thing. Like my patients, I'm not saying this to my patients, but patients know when you're seeing them as people and not just some like symptom or some number. So I think it is hopefully transmitted in the way that I take care of patients, but I also have a mission to help other healthcare providers who have a faith-based practice to think about how that can be integrated into their vocational commitments. Thanks. Thank you very much. Over here. Oh, hi. Sorry. Hi. Jeff Nicholas in the philosophy department. Uh, he's got two books out on McIntyre, so thanks for the quote there for him. <laughs> Great. Um, I really appreciate your, your talk. I agree with uh, much of what you have to say. I, I think I have some questions I want to ask about, um, you said, how our language is infected. And I, I want to ask uh, for a little bit of reflection on the language of the talk itself and how it is infected. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and how we think mm -hmm. about humanities mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and the use of humanities and how that is infected. Hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about starting with Frankenstein and the story hmm. that is told about Frankenstein, but it, it, it misses like the really important part there, hmm. which is uh, Shelley is talking about the loss of women in society, yeah. the yeah. loss of, of women from science. Yes. Uh, yes. And I, I noticed you. throughout you know, your talk, you talked about uh, uh, medicine and science reaching to God, the man reaching to God, the man doing this, the man doing that. The only time you talked about the woman was when she was a patient. Hmm. Um, hmm. And, and then you said she was, hmm. she's a machine. And I was expecting to say something about obstetrics there because in hmm. uh, obstetrics literature, that's how women are described, right? She's a machine. We're going right. to produce, right, produce this baby. Uh, we can put her asleep or whatever it is that we need to do, do hmm. the epidural and that sort of stuff. So there's really in medicine and, hu and humanities a loss of woman that I think we see uh, in, infected in the language that mm. we're talking about. And so when you keep going back to Aristotle, mm. right, as the source of humanities, of course, he is mm -hmm. uh, part of this infection as well because yeah, for sure. he doesn't see the woman as completely rational yep, and completely. Totally. So, so how do we as people mm. who teach humanities stop our language from being infected? How do we, starting this school of nursing and health sciences, uh, produce humanities ca that can speak to yes. women as well as mm. the man, the man, the man. Thank you. I love that. I love that question. So I, I have actually, um, thank you. I mean, I think having this this different lens through which to like read this paper again when I go back through it with that lens will be incredibly helpful. So thank you. Um, and I think, so I, I have a huge interest in this field of medicine called narrative medicine. I actually have a grant in narrative medicine. Um, to sort of look at the way that language impacts culture and healthcare. We just um, had a uh, manuscript published a few weeks ago in BMC Medical Education, actually, if you're interested about medicine and the use of language. And I think a couple things. I think, one, I totally agree with you that, um, you know, society um, has not made room for the biological reality of women, and a lot of our language is very um, male-centered and doesn't make space for women um, with, in recognizing their full and inherent dignity. I think my own niche that I can speak to with any type of you know, credibility is the, is, is the niche of medical language. And my focus has not been mostly on gendered language, but around language that dehumanizes, which again, dehumanization can happen to both men and women. 
So um, I do a lot of speaking on um, abortion in particular and think about how the prenatal child and really anyone whose dignity we find inconvenient, we depersonalize them for the use of language. But I have a special interest in um, end-of-life care because I am an internist, so I don't deliver babies, I don't see children, I just see adults. And especially at end of life, um, I notice that oftentimes when we're in like the ICU or taking care of people who are dying, you'll hear things like, especially for older adults who may have dementia, you'll hear things like, that patient's like a vegetable, which I hate that term. I, we use that all the time, actually, in medicine to describe people who have limited cognitive ability. And I'm like, no one's a vegetable. This is like disgusting to me. And I used to use that term. I used to use these like ableist, ageist terms all the time. Like vegetable, or like the worst one is when patients are in the ICU dying, you'll hear physicians say something like, oh, that patient's circling the drain. I'm like, you know what circles the drain? Trash circles the drain. Like that. And I've had patients tell me and, and um, write about, about like when they were like sort of semi-conscious and dying, like, and then if they made it, like that was the last thing they might have ever heard before leaving this earth. It's like they're circling the drain, like it's awful. So I, I have had, and I also am very interested actually in medical language that stigmatizes around um, weight in particular. There's a lot of interest in medical education around weight stigma. Um, but I will have to think more about how to make space in like academic talks in particular, especially in my own talking around making space for um, language that isn't so like one-sided. Thank you. Thank you for a fantastic talk. I'm, I'm Chris Berard in English. And um, one of the things that really struck me in your speech was when you um, spoke about how medicine is called to be a false god or is seen by our society as a false god. Right. And as a physician, particularly as an internist encountering yeah. people at the first line, people look to you as sort of the high priest For sure. of that false god. For sure. Now, you can, when there are certain physical issues, you know, send them to different specialists, uh, mm -hmm. medical specialists, mm -hmm. but when these sort of more theological or philosophical questions that are so entangled with the human person mm -hmm. come before you. Right. Um, I wonder how, like, how you can address it, how you're allowed to in terms of totally. your professional, like, um, uh, the rules of, of how you do your thing so that you're not alienating a patient, but yet at totally. the same, ta same time trying to address their needs. So mm -hmm. how can you kind of... What is the what are rules of the thumb that you have for addressing those sort of n maybe less medical in terms of well holistically yes medical but not immediately Thanks, technical. Chris. Yeah, so those are that's a great question. Like luckily, like thank you for like the easy question that I can actually answer as a non philosopher. Um, so my whole like academic niche is actually like religion and spirituality and patient centered care. I mean that's like what I publish on and like what I write about. So I mentioned Cicely Saunders, who has like this cool model of like total pain. And it's a circle and there are these four quadrants. And she says people are like, they suffer or are well or experience pain in four intersecting quadrants, physical, emotional, spiritual, and social. And they all intersect. So for example, we have a lot of patients who have like uncontrolled physical pain at the end of life. And it's actually because they have un undertreated spiritual distress, existential distress. And it's not until you treat that that their physical pain improves. But if we just like don't even recognize that we're chasing our tail with sometimes these physical symptoms, especially like nausea and pain. And when like something's afoot and you're like, huh? You have to wonder if there's some underlying spiritual distress, you know? So, and it's not until you sort of recognize that. So when I actually first saw that model a few years ago, I was like, wow, I'm a general internist and I trained at one of the best places in the country. And I like feel pretty, I mean, I feel pretty good actually about my ability to sort of diagnose like physical distress and emotional distress a little bit less so, but it's still pretty good at it. But I was like, social distress, spiritual distress, like what is that? Like I have no idea what that is. And I felt a sense of shame. Like I was only seeing half my patient. I'm a general internist, right? So it's not that these patients don't have these things, they do have these things. And then it's our ability to be able to recognize them. And then just like we would get people, hopefully, to the specialist that would help us treat that. I mean, unless you have training in, in CPE or clinical pastoral education, you don't want to wade into spiritual trust that you're not trained to handle. But just like if I picked up Brigada syndrome, which is like this really complex heart arrhythmia, like I would send them to a cardiologist, right? If someone has spiritual distress, we have a wonderful actually um, spiritual care department in Michigan Medicine where a lot of people have their own, like obviously clergy that we can pull in. 
but they're actually like our validated ways actually to ask these questions. So like in the outpatient setting, there's something called FICA, which was developed by Dr. Pachelski um, at GW. And it stands for FICA. And it's a way to like, ask patients if you want to do like a spiritual assessment where you can sort of, F stands for faith, like do you have a faith? I is an importance, is it important to you? C is like a community, do you have a community of people around this that sort of support you? And A is how can I best address your spiritual and religious needs in your healthcare? So FICA, right? And so that A is I think the most patient-centered. And it's not like, I'm not proselytizing anybody, I'm just asking in a very patient-centered way. The other questions that you can ask, which I think are really lovely, actually, that were talked to me by mentors, like asking people, like, you know, are, are you at, are you at peace? You know, and you could, you'd be surprised, actually, what kind of like answers come out of that from people. And a lot of them are like spiritual distress. Some kind of like, why is God doing this to me? What, what's going to happen when I die? Like, I've been separated from the church. Like, is God punishing me? And so, but so actually, last Friday I ran like a whole half-day conference for physicians, teaching them how to do this. It was a grant that actually I got from Michigan Medicine. It was a continuing medical education innovation grant, where we actually the title of the course was "Bridging the Gaps: Incorporating Religion, Spiritual, and Patient-Centered Care." Because most physicians are like, ah, like this is so bizarre to me. Like I don't even know. And so, but if we help them feel comfortable with some validated tools, give them permission to do so. But as you can imagine. You're only going to wade into this likely if, like, you yourself has like, have like thought about these issues yourself. So, how I help people think more comfortably about it is I sort of make it akin. Actually, we have a piece published in the Annals of Internal Medicine about this, that the spiritual history question are like the last taboo in medicine. It used to be like the sexual history. It used to be like, I'm not going to ask patients about sex. Like, that's too private, or like, that's not my job, or like, it's not related to healthcare. And of course, now we ask those patients questions all the time. So why would we think about these spiritual questions any different? Um, so I do think, you know, yes, you, sh you can ask about it. Yes, there's actually validated ways in medicine to do it. Yes, like this is a team sport, like any other thing. But like, also, like as Dan Salmese says, like. The physician who themselves haven't like had their own well full is probably not going to wade into the space with others. But whenever people get freaked out about it, I said, whatever your belief system is, this is a patient-centered thing to do, and you should be doing it. And we've published papers about like why pa physicians don't do it, and like you can imagine all those reasons. But um, my whole like professional work is actually trying to help physicians and nurses and healthcare providers like do this for patients because I, I see all the time. I was actually before I was a Christian like seven years ago. I was upstairs seeing a patient, 30 years old, was in with acute leukemia, getting inducted, and that's like the most hellish thing you can go through. And four weeks of induction chemotherapy for acute leukemia is awful. And so my student took the history and physical and was like very fine, it was actually very fine. At the end, I noticed like a statue on his shelf, his windowsill. And I was like, is it all right if I ask you about the statue? And he was like, yeah, he's like, it's Our Lady of Guadalupe and I'm a Catholic and like my faith is like the only thing that's gotten me through this. Then he was like, you know what? He's like, I've been here a month and you guys are the only people that have asked me about that statue, my statue. And I get to feel the sense of shame, like what, what is like our problem? And I see all the time when we walk in on rounds sometimes with students, like people will have like a rosary or a prayer card or something and they'll, they'll put it away because they know, rightly so, that actually a lot of physicians are gonna think that they're crazy or you know, like they just, if people start using words of hope or miracles, the physicians like don't know what to do, right? So my whole thing is to be like, this is unacceptable. We would never do this with any other identity of a patient. Why are we doing this? And then there's all these reasons that we're working through. But yes, yes to all of your questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, this is like, that's my one area that I can like really speak about well. Besides Taylor Swift lyrics, which we can talk about in the, in the breakout room. I can also talk that about really well, unfortunately. Thank you, Dr. Collier. I thought sure. that was so beautiful and, and, and inspiring, really. Um, and I have a, a, a sort of related question um, based on your research or other studies. Mm -hmm. What is or what should be uh, the role of prayer in medicine mm. from, the, mm -hmm. from the doctor's perspective and Love also the, the patient's perspective? These Thank are you. the great questions. Thank you. So, um, so we actually had at my conference last Friday a whole session dedicated on like prayer, um, and specifically how to respond because it was for healthcare providers how to respond to patient requests for prayer. And so the AMA, the American Medical Association, actually in their Journal of Ethics has like a wonderful actually paper about how to respond to patient requests for prayer that's very evidence based and. You know, prayer is one of those things when patients ask you, it's usually again a, a question or a gesture for something else. Like they're looking for you to like, 
to sort of, can they trust you? Is, is God involved? Can, they, can we bring God into this space? It's a beautiful, actually, gesture when patients ask you to pray for them. But you can't always assume that you know what that means, right? Because actually prayer for, like, different people means different things. So as a Christian, I might have an idea of what prayer is, but, like, if I had a patient who was not Christian, I just can't assume. So, like, you know, the response is, like, you know, thank you so much. Um, can I ask what you had in mind, right? And asking what they had in mind. And the AMA Journal of Ethics recommends that if you have a discordant faith or tradition from somebody to have the patient lead the prayer if possible, and you will sort of bear silent witness to that, um, because then you won't, like, assume what your idea of prayer is is, like, their idea, and that could be awkward. Um, but um, also, just for me, as a healthcare professional, my biggest, my biggest issue, actually, with probably faith when I was a medical person, actually, was the concept of suffering. And it really was actually during the time that my chief resident was dying, when I was not a Christian, that I was, like, really angry. I was like wrestling with God. Like I hear about God and maybe, and maybe God's good and all powerful, but what kind of BS is this? That like our best and brightest person is being taken from us when all these other people upstairs are trying their hardest to die and like God's taking Jake. Like this doesn't make sense, you know? And so, but now as a Christian, I mean, most of my patients, I'm not fixing. Like I, I can, we definitely can provide healing in different quadrants. Again, emotional hearing, spiritual hearing with clergy, and social healing, but a lot of physical healing is not going to be coming in this world. And so I, I used to be really despondent over that because physicians like to like fix things and do things. And now I have this like, it's never fully perfect, obviously, in the side of heaven, but this idea that like this isn't the way things are supposed to be. And God someday will wipe every tear away and make all things new. And the resurrection of bodies, especially when we see, you know, broken bodies is so comforting to me. But like I pray for my patients and I feel like I'm doing something with that. So like the boys and I, so I have four boys and three of the boys, four boys still share the same bedroom. And um, at night, like we'll go in and like we pray for mom's, they, we pray for mom's patients. So we feel like we're like a part of this and it actually feels really beautiful. And my patients know um, often because I'm sort of a public person um, in our medical space as a Christian. And they often say like, you know, will you pray for me? And I'm like, sister, I absolutely will. You know, so it's actually part of this therapeutic, I think, rapport that again, I feel really lucky to be able to have. Um, and even sometimes in the patient exam room, I had a lady the other day, um, a black woman who I see, I haven't seen for a long time, um, I'll call her sister C, who was just diagnosed with breast cancer. And it's just, a, it's, she's in a tough, tough situation and helping trying to navigate her care and trying to get a second opinion for her. But so I was like, you know, do you want to pray about this? And she was like, yes. And she just grabbed my hands and we put our head down and we prayed. And it was just like so beautiful. And I know that's not for everybody and not everyone feels comfortable with that. But I do think there's a huge role for prayer, not only for as sort of having a culturally hum humble uh, practice and be able to respond to patient requests, but as a healthcare provider, the ability to pray to the Lord for my patients, to me, provides also me with a lot of comfort as well. Thank you. But if for those who want to be data-driven about it, there's actually the AMA Journal of Ethics, and actually there's also a paper in Academic Medicine um, that's published that says, doctor, will you, will you pray with me? Because also, too, especially during the COVID pandemic, there was, no, there was no one allowed into the hospital. And so physicians were like the only people, like our clergy weren't allowed in, the chaplains weren't allowed in because of COVID. And so, you, so this paper sort of says, you actually have a moral obligation as a physician not to just shut all these folks off and know how to do this in the moment. Because sometimes it's an emergency. Someone's like crashing, you need to intubate them, a crash section, you don't have time to call clergy. And like people are like, can we pray? And so you better be able to respond to that because actually that we would accommodate any other patient need. And like, this is a patient need. You know, so that paper also like pulls on us to sort of say this is an obligation you have to you have to respond, which I think is really cool. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Yeah, thanks. Collier, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, this is super fun. Thanks for having me.